This podcast is brought to you by the American Enterprise Institute. If you like what you hear, please subscribe, rate, review, and share. Thanks for listening. Here's our show. What in the hell's going on? What the hell is going on? What the hell is going on? I don't know what the hell he's talking about. You don't have to know what the hell is on it. What the hell's the matter with these guys? We don't know what's going on. What the hell's going on? Who in God's name knows what it's all about? Hi, I'm Danielle Pletka. And I'm Mark Keeson. Welcome to our podcast, What the Hell is Going On? Mark, what the hell is going on? What the hell is going on is we're trying to figure out what the hell is going on north of our border because Canada is in a world of hurt in a number of ways. But one of them is they've enacted a new system uh, called MAID, Medical Assistance in Dying, which is killing about 27 people a day on average in Canada, over 10,000 a year. And this is not medically assisted suicide like you've seen in a couple of well, a handful of U.S. states where you have people who are, you know, in the last throes of a terminal illness and are in incredible pain and are seeking a way to end their life. They're killing people who have disabilities. They're killing people with mental illness. They're killing people who decide that they're on the verge of homelessness and the system is not going to be able to help give them housing and they'd rather die than be homeless. So they're applying for and, and being granted the ability to take their own life with medical assistance. They are killing soldiers who came back from Afghanistan with PTSD but can't access health care. And so their mental illness is not being treated and so they're being approved for medically assisted suicide. People with mental illness generally or people with with health care problems where they can't get treatment because the Canadian system of government health care is so horrible that they're waiting you know, up to five years for treatment and they just give up and decide that it's better off to die than to go untreated for their, whatever their pain is. I mean, this is a system of euthanasia, of the inconvenient, of the people who are burdens on society, people who are society should be wrapping their arms around and caring for and are vulnerable. And Canada has essentially decided that it's better to kill them than to take care of them. And this interview that we're about to do is one of the most shocking and disturbing things. Like, truly, I thought that he was describing like Nazi Germany in, in the early uh, 1930s. And it's happening right north of our border right now. So let's share some of the numbers because this, it's not assisted suicide. This is euthanasia. There is a difference, which we'll go into a little bit with our guest. So this law passed in 2016. In 2021, there were 10,064 made provisions, that's how they call it, reported in Canada. 3.3% of all deaths. It gets worse. It gets grosser. All of this is gross. The number of cases of made in 2021, we don't have last year's numbers yet, represent a growth rate of 32.4% over 2020. Every single Canadian province is represented there. There were 12,000 written requests for made in 2021. They are taking these euthanized Canadians, some of whom have nothing worse than hearing loss in some instances, and in some cases, pressuring them or at the very least providing them opportunities to become organ donors. A 2022 study showed that Canada leads the world in harvesting organ from those who have received medically assisted death. I just want everybody to think about this because you know we talk with disgust about how the People's Republic of China, how the communist government there actually harvests organs and murders prisoners, including political prisoners, in order to harvest their uh, organs, in order to give them to uh, those who are deserving by the lights of the Chinese Communist Party. No, the Canadians beat them in organ harvesting. As Mark said, they are offering, not simply offering suicide to people 
who are on the verge of death or people who have some sort of psychiatric and physical nexus that is uncurable. They are offering it to people. In one instance, it was a woman who could not receive, was not receiving the assistance that she had been promised and called four times to protest the fact that she had not gotten the assistance that she was promised by the Canadian authorities. And they said to her at the end, well, maybe you'd just rather, you know, talk to our euthanasia people instead. I mean, you wouldn't believe it if you didn't see the documentation. So just to show also how horrific and Orwellian this is, they actually celebrate this in Canada as being like a moral good. There's a company called Simmons, which is a clothing store in Quebec, and they actually did a TV ad featuring a woman who had decided to end her life through this MAID program. Let's play a clip of that. Dying in a hospital is not what's natural. That's not what's soft. In these kind of moments, you need softness. It can take dying to figure out what living is actually like. So then the National Post in Canada reported after this ad appeared, this is the headline, woman featured in pro-euthanasia commercial wanted to live, friends say. Okay, let me, I just want to read this to you. This is the story in the National Post, Canada's National Post. The woman featured in a glamorous pro-euthanasia commercial for a Canadian clothing retailer only opted for assisted suicide after her years-long attempts to secure proper health care failed, her friends revealed. Jennifer Hatch, 37, was a central figure in An All is Beauty, a three-minute film produced by Simmons that celebrated Hatch's last days before seeking medically-assisted suicide. Last week, CTV confirmed that Hatch was the same woman who had spoken to them in June about her failed attempts to find proper treatment for Elhurst-Danlos syndrome, a rare painful condition in which patients suffer from excessively fragile skin and connective tissues. Quote, I feel like I'm falling through the cracks. So if I'm not able to access health care, am I then able to access death care, she asked. And that's what led me to look into MAID, Hatch told CTV. Like more than a million British Columbians, Hatch was left without primary care after family doctor moved away. And so after her Elhurst danlos diagnosis 10 years ago, Hatch's treatment had largely consisted of chaotic and ineffective stream of specialist appointments, none of which had any background in her condition. It's far easier to let go than keep fighting, she said to CTV. So this woman's death was being celebrated in a television campaign. And the reason she chose medically assisted death was because the Canadian healthcare system wouldn't provide her the basic, even palliative care for her condition because the Canadian healthcare system is so pathetic. And so you've got a system of government-run health care. You know, we laughed back when Obamacare came up and people joked about death panels. Well, they've got death panels going on in Canada because they're taking people who can't get health care, treatment, you know, even pain management for their conditions, mental health care. And they're just saying, you know what? We have this new program called MAID and it can just help you end all your suffering. Why Why don't we do that instead? It's just the most stunning thing I've gross, disgusting, horrific thing I've heard. And it's happening literally in a country that's just like just over our border that's supposed to be just like us. Yes. Well, they're clearly not just like us. It's time for our interview. Great conversation with Alexander Rakin. It's the first time we've had him on. Alexander Rakin is a freelance writer. He writes about medical ethics and specifically about the Canadian medical system. He is, as you can probably tell, Canadian. He's written on Canada's euthanasia laws for National Review, for New Atlantis, for the Free Beacon, and others. He is extremely knowledgeable, and you are going to be as shocked as we were by this interview. Here's our interview. Well, Alexander, welcome to the podcast. It's a pleasure to be on. Well, you're, you're joining us from across the Berlin Wall there in Canada, where you have a new euthanasia law that now, I believe, accounts for 3.3% of all deaths in Canada due to medically assisted suicide. To coin a phrase, what the hell is going on in the Great White North? 
That's really the million dollar question. And 3.3% uh, sounds sounds low until you realize that that's over 10,000 cases of euthanasia just in 2021. So more than 27 Canadians each day in 2021 died by the hands of their physicians or, or nurses. This is quite frankly, the world's largest euthanasia program. It's the world's fastest growing euthanasia program. You literally have to go back to a system of non-voluntary euthanasia to see the rapid growth that we've seen in Canada. And we can go into and why that's the case, but it started with a Supreme Court decision in 2015, Carter v. Canada, where the Supreme Court of Canada unanimously overturned its own precedents to decriminalize assisted suicide and euthanasia. And then you had Justin Trudeau, he's been the prime minister who was tasked by the Supreme Court of Canada to develop system safeguards that, again, in 2015, the first bill was C-14, which was passed in 2016. And since then, we just had a slippery slope that has just continued sliding. So thank you for the explanation. Thank you for being with us. Help us understand, because, you know, I think for a lot of Americans, this is actually a little bit confusing, how it happened, how the decision of the Supreme Court was relevant. Would you just bounce through the TikTok of so-called MAID, the medical assistance in dying, was actually born? Because, of course, you know, prior to 2016, not only was assisted suicide or, you know, euthanasia illegal, it was also unpopular in Canada. Kind of probably a but metaphor as well for what is happening, especially with organ donations involving made. We can go back to that later. So let's start from the beginning. Euthanasia was considered to be a criminal offense. In the early 1990s, there was a Supreme Court case called Rodriguez v. British Columbia, where the Supreme Court of Canada, in a split decision, five to four, they ruled that euthanasia and assisted suicide should continue to be criminalized. They argued that safeguards would not be possible, that the government has a duty, this is what the majority ruled, of course, that the government has a duty to protect the blood. That was in the early 1990s. Afterwards, you had one of the most successful public relations campaigns that arguably has ever existed in a Western democratic country. You had a very well-funded lobby group called Dying with Dignity in Canada, and there are actually um, parallels to this happening in the United States right now. A very well-funded group funded by multi-hundred millionaires. Again, Canada doesn't quite have the same, number, the same amount of money flowing uh, from its politics as the U.S. You don't need as much to buy out um, Canadian politicians. And it's not an exaggeration. You know, we can talk about in more details about each part of this, but Canada's media landscape, its politics, specifically in the Liberal Party of Canada, which Justin Trudeau is the leader of, of course, even NGOs. So the Canadian equivalent of the AARP, not entirely, uh, <laughs> not entirely original uh, naming, but the Canadian equivalent is the CARP, was bought out by a man named Moses Namir, who is a multimedia mogul in Canada. He bought it out. He replaced the board and he fired the longstanding executive vice president of the CARP because she said that she believed that uh, the CARP should have no position on MAID. And he replaced her with uh, the former head of Dying with Dignity Canada. So this is just one anecdote of dozens that we can talk about of how in a very short time, uh, public opinion was skewed and expert opinion was skewed in order to legalize euthanasia and assisted suicide and to prevent common sense safeguards that Canadians, at least in public polling, wanted to happen. I almost jumped in at the start of this question because I want to go back to something you said. You talked about harvesting of organs of people who receive euthanasia. And I'm looking here at a VOA story. There's a 2022 study that showed Canada leads the world in harvesting organs from those who receive medically assisted death. I mean, this is what the People's Republic of China does with prisoners. They execute people to harvest their organs. I mean, this is happening across our border. 
So let's be clear, right? There is obviously a difference between euthanasia and system of euthanasia and assisted suicide. So I, I, I do want to be clear not to over exaggerate or <laughs> exaggerate at all, but it's also important not to discount it out of hand. So two parts for this. So first of all, regarding prisoners, prisoners in Canada have been receiving MAID despite their ombudsperson having, for lack of a better term, hesitating over how somebody could consent to euthanasia if they don't have a chance of parole. So this is happening in Canada with prisoners. Now, in terms of the organ donations, the system is fraud. And I'll, I'll give an example. What defenders and supporters of the current system stress is that the decision to donate organs has nothing to do with the decision to choose mate, that these are done uh, at different points that somebody has was already approved for me. But you can look at what's happening in Ontario, for instance, where as part of the system and the public, it can obviously as a public health care system, the organization responsible for this in Ontario is a public organization. It's called the Ontario Trillium Gift of Life Network. I reached out to them with media questions as part of my reporting. They said they were going to respond to me within two weeks, and that was eight months ago. One of the reasons why I think they are not so forthcoming about what is happening is that part of their official system is that they prompt people with disabilities, or rather anyone who is applying for me, as soon as they have the first approval for MAID. And as part of MAID, you need to actually be approved for MAID, you need to have two physicians or nurse practitioners uh, to sign off on a MAID request. So before someone is formally approved for MAID, right, in between first and second assessment, they are already being prompted for organ donations. Ontario Trillium Gift of Life Network has also been doing, they've been launching a survey for people with mental health illnesses, because people with only psychiatric conditions are going to soon qualify. You know, it, it, either it's going to be in a month or in a year from now, if the government's bill to delay the onset is going to be implemented. Most people think of assisted death, euthanasia, as someone has a terminal illness and in order to the, avoid the pain of dealing with the final moments of the terminal illness, they choose assisted death. You're saying that people with mental illness, with depression, with things like that, are going to qualify for assisted death in Canada? They just needed to have any excuse of a physical symptom. So somebody with depression and diabetes has already qualified. Or someone with a disability? With depression. Like physical disability? Yes. So hearing loss. Hearing loss. There's been uh, already multiple cases of people qualifying for euthanasia because of hearing loss. Also, in those cases, those people had depression, but they qualified right now because of the hearing loss. In a year or in a month, it would be just having the mental illness would be a valid reason. But I think it's important, Mark, that people who are listening understand that this is not simply as it is in a number of U.S. states, people who are, you know, one foot in the grave, so to speak, who are looking at certain death within a number of months or a particular period of time or have an incurable disease. This is, and Alexander, correct me if I'm wrong, this is anybody who has any kind of physical problem at all, correct? So you're correct fundamentally in the sense that under the Oregon model, which is implemented in 10 states and the District of Columbia, you need to have a terminal illness and prognosis of less than six months left to live in order to qualify. That said, people in the United States have already been qualifying from psychiatric illnesses, specifically anorexia. So Despite the chief legal advocacy officer for Compassion Choices, which is the leading pro-assisted suicide lobby here in the United States, the chief legal advocacy officer is saying that no one with any anorexia should qualify under the Oregon model. He wrote this in a letter to the editor uh, to the Colorado Sun. We've already had at least four cases of exactly that, where people with anorexia have already qualified and died through assisted suicide in the U.S. 
So that's the first part. The, the problems that we've seen in Canada also exist in the United States, though Canada is just much further ahead um, than the U.S. is. So that's the first part. The second part is that in Canada, according to the formal safeguards, it sounds like the system is much narrower than is actually being implemented. So according to the formal safeguards, someone needs to have a grievous and irremediable medical condition causing suffering. It needs to be an advanced stage of decline in uh, a lack of capability or capacity in some regards. Those are the formal requirements. Uh, there's a few more. It depends if you have, quote, uh, if your natural death is reasonably foreseeable, in which case there's a, a distinction between track one and track two cases. But as you can probably guess, a natural death that is reasonably foreseeable is an undefined term, right? So people have been qualifying for a natural death that is reasonably foreseeable just because of old age, which is something that we have not seen in any other jurisdiction. So as part of all of this is that the formal safeguards are being interpreted loosely by Canadian physicians. Um, and that was part of my reporting that I did for the New Atlantis, is that the Canadian Association of Made Assessors and Providers knows that the suffering that people are applying for made in some cases is because of things like credit card debt, or lack of housing, or poverty, or lack of medical care. And yet, they're signing off on the check marks for all of those formal safeguards, where someone with uh, arthritis, tinnitus, hearing loss, diabetes, all of those conditions, even though they can be well managed, um, are instead used as uh, an excuse, as a justification for somebody's made, even though the cause of suffering is not medical. So doesn't the state have a conflict of interest here? Because in Canada, unlike the United States, you have government-run health care which, as I understand it, in a lot of these cases, the people are unable to access the kind of care they need to manage their conditions. And so they just give up and seek assisted death instead. But I mean, isn't there a conflict of interest? Because obviously, the healthcare system would be better off if they just got rid of these people because they're getting rid of demand. Yeah, I mean, put people in the studies and saying very vocally for years, and the government isn't listening to that. Over 140 disability groups signed a collective letter before the most recent expansion of MAID, which happened in 2021 under Bill C-7, which said that their very lives are at risk precisely because of what you're talking about. Canada's healthcare system is in a very bad shape. Don't listen to me about this. You can listen to the head of the Canadian Medical Association who issued a warning that Canada's healthcare system is undergoing, quote, a collapse. And she said this last summer. Uh, Canada's Minister of Health said that Canada's healthcare system is undergoing a sickness. Canada's healthcare system is not doing well. And the people who take up a disproportionate amount of resources are people who have chronic disabilities or chronic illnesses. Those individuals, though their disability groups, are saying that MAID is exactly that. It's a conflict of interest. It's a way of providing an alternative to medical services. And in fact, many disability groups have now entered a state where outside of their windows, when you enter their buildings like to access supports and cares, they have signs now that say, your life is worth living, your life is important, we will not offer you MAID as a substitute for a lack of resources. And the reason why disability groups and disability advocates have to put up the signs is because of the dozens and dozens of cases of well-reported cases, not just by me, but uh, dozens of cases where people are being offered an alternative to services through MAID. That includes Canadian veterans bought in Afghanistan who suffer PTSD fighting for their country, they come back and instead of receiving the PTSD care that they're asking for from veteran services, they're instead, when we've had four or five cases of those, 
They're instead being offered made. The terrorists didn't kill them, but the Canadian government is. Exactly. The wait times for treatment-resistant mental illnesses in Ontario, for instance, is five years. Five years. That's incredible. That really is is horrifying. Yet for MAID, if you have track one, so track one is when you have a natural death that is reasonably foreseeable, and it sounds like it means terminal. It doesn't necessarily mean terminal. It could be you have an infection. It could be you're just old, right? All of that has been interpreted by Canadian physicians and nurse practitioners to mean that your natural death is reasonably foreseeable. If you have that, theoretically, you can have made that same day as long as you have two physicians or nurse practitioners willing to sign off on that. Look, like, let's be clear. The vast majority of Canadian physicians and nurse practitioners, again, I'm stressing the nurse aspect. I mean, nurses do a ton of work within the medical system, but they've never done work like this, which is to assess and to provide euthanasia. The vast majority of Canadian clinicians want nothing to do with the system. If you look at the number of clinicians who are involved with this, who actually are part of the assessment and provide, I am using the term assessment and providing because that's the term that they use. The actual number has been pretty much stable from the beginning, uh, where it's around 1,200 clinicians every year since we've had annualized reporting. So around 1,200 are part of the system. They're willing to do it. They do it. The vast majority do not. And that number hasn't risen over time. The issue is that those clinicians who do the work in MAID, um, people that I've interviewed, like people like Stephanie Green, who's the president of the Canadian Association of MAID Assessors and Providers, CAMAP, you know, uh, Ellen Weeb, another example of a very prolific MAID provider I talked about in my uh, New Atlantis piece. These clinicians have done MAID hundreds and hundreds of times. So, Alexander, I I don't even know where to go with this. The other part of this that I don't understand is that for the Canadian government, these decisions are being cast as human rights decisions. That, to me, seems rather bizarre. And they've gotten criticized, actually, by outside human rights groups. But there's another part of this as well. Apparently, family members have no say, this is the New York Times reporting, maybe it's wrong, but no say in the decision to choose death. How is that even possible? Reporting is clearly accurate. This is the exact same story I've heard three separate times. Family members find out that their loved one, who they believe do not have the capacity to consent to any medical decision, let alone euthanasia, they find out that their loved one is going to receive MAID in 48 hours. In each case, the family members send urgent, desperate messages to the hospital or the clinicians who are part of that MAID team. They try to send them their psychiatric history. They try to send them uh, other information over why their family members does not have the capacity to consent to this. In each of those cases, their frequently desperate messages are not listened to. They go to the police. They ask the police to put a stop to it. The police investigate. They look at the made uh, paperwork. They see that it's signed by a physician or a nurse practitioner. And again, any physician, any nurse practitioner in Canada can be part of made. There's no requirement for any specialized training. There's no requirement for any knowledge base, essentially for the vast majority of cases. So they reach out to the police. The police say there's nothing to do. The MAID happens in 48 hours. After the MAID is performed, in each of those cases, the family members are still reeling from the deaths of their loved ones. They try to understand why it is that their loved ones were using. They reach out to the hospital and request medical information over why that decision was made. According to provincial law, in each of those cases, in theory, they should be able to access it. In each of those cases, they were denied access. And that they were denied access for the same reason, which is because, quote, they were not acting in the interest of the patient who's now deceased. So this is happening on a large scale. And in fact, even in the annual reporting that we have in Canada by the federal government, and we, we can go into it on why the federal reporting is very much skewed 
it's very much biased in favor of uh, the made providers who are the ones who are the only ones who are actually informing the reporting process. Um, but even in that data, uh, there's a question that's asked, which is how do made providers know that the choice for made was voluntary? And they're given different prompts where they can answer yes or no based on what they uh, come across. If memory serves, it's between 40 to only 40 to 50% of them actually consult any family, any member, any family members of that individual. So even in that very much skewed reporting, a majority do not even consult family members. In the research for this, the head of the Canadian Institute for Inclusion and Citizenship, which is, I guess, a, a human rights organization inside Canada, called the MAID law, quote, probably the biggest existential threat to disabled people since the Nazis program in Germany in the 1930s, unquote. I mean, listening to you, I cannot but agree with him. But what I'm asking myself constantly as I listen to you talking about this, as I listen to people advocating for this is, where is this coming from? What is the provenance of this desire to kill people? I don't get it. So can I take a digression, a, a minor digression, if that's okay with you? Just comparing what the Nazi euthanasia program was to the Canadian system. The comparison is not necessarily to the T4, the Action T4 euthanasia program which started on September 1st, 1939, as a wartime measures act, where the Nazi regime started euthanizing. Um, they essentially gave a carte blanche to any physician to euthanize their patients. The more worthwhile comparison, I believe, is to, to the fall of 1933, because that's when you have the Nazi party coming in, right? They seized control of the right stuff. Two of the first bills that they passed were a sterilization bill, and a euthanasia bill. The sterilization bill was passed with little protest besides the Catholic Church. And uh, we have meticulous records of who the Nazis decided to sterilize, including people who were blind and deaf, which was considered excessive, even by the standards of the time, right? Sterilization programs existed in North America. By the time that the Nazi Germany was sterilizing people with disabilities, more than half of the United States had forced sterilization. Um, the only sterilization program in the entire British Empire, meanwhile, the only mass scale sterilization program was in Alberta. So Canada was also part of that. And I think that there are some similarities to the eugenics arguments and some parallels between sterilization and MAID. So that's the first part. The second bill that was proposed, which was passed in an altered fashion, but the proposal was for euthanasia. In many ways, the safeguards were more meticulous than the safeguards that we have in Canada. So in the proposed Nazi bill, only people with terminal illnesses could qualify. Um, you needed to have three physicians as opposed to two, and two of those physicians needed to be part of an expert panel, right? So you couldn't just doctor shop under the proposed Nazi bill. The patient needed to express, to, to request it, Right, so a physician couldn't just approach and ask someone if they were interested and then proceed from there. And despite the safeguards being much larger, and to be fair, this is still Nazi Germany, right? So there was an additional safeguard that, quote, no lives uh, w with value to the state will be destroyed, right? Despite those additional safeguards and a much more limited euthanasia program, that bill in 1933 was killed. The actual euthanasia, the actual bill that was passed removed the euthanasia provision. So when euthanasia started in Nazi Germany, it had to start on, as a wartime measures act that I alluded to before. So there is something, and this is not an exaggeration, this is not hyperbole, that the Canadian public are literally more accepting of euthanasia than the German public in 1933. So when we ask, why is this? Right. How did Canada get to the way that it is? I argued in uh, an article in the National Review that this isn't really what Canadians wanted. Canadians, like Americans, largely support assisted suicide and euthanasia in a very limited 
spoke. They supported for people with terminal illnesses who've tried everything, who've been through psychiatric assessments, and there's nothing left to do. There are good arguments over why there still are problems with that system, and we can discuss that, but that's largely what the public supported. What actually was passed in Canada is that people are dying who are no longer even, quote, at end of life. Let me repeat that again. People are dying in Canada from hearing loss. There is no alternative. I mean, it's, it's, it's indescribable, right? People are dying from treatable and sometimes curable conditions. There was an article that came out from Madeline Lee, who's a prolific maid provider. She's a psychiatrist. She's also involved as a technical lead for a national training curriculum for MAID providers. And she wrote in an article, in an op-ed that was published last week, about her struggles in providing euthanasia to someone who had 65% chance of a positive prognosis. And she writes in that article, again, about her struggle as a MAID provider. And in my reporting, that's something that I've come across quite frequently, is that the physicians who are doing this work are traumatized by the work that they're doing. They know that it is wrong. They know that it is discriminatory to provide suicide prevention for everyone else, but providing expedience, suicide expedience, only for people with disabilities or people with serious illnesses. And they discuss this internally, they discuss this in private. Only now have we seen some people go public with these discussions. Anyway, I know that's a bit no, of a rant, so apologies. It's, it's, for, it's um, fascinating. And I'll tell you the other thing that I find troubling about this is that the policy is regressive. So, you know, we've already talked about how, you know, the Canadian healthcare system is in shambles. And so you've got, you know, people who can't get treatment for PTSD, for mental illness, for all these other treatments. And so they're giving up and applying for MAID instead. But you've also got people who are living on the periphery of society who can't get by. And so they're applying for it. There was a Wall Street Journal article that quoted a 54-year-old man named Amir Fasud, who lives in Niagara region of Ontario. And he applied for MAID earlier this year. It says, quote, he had serious medical conditions, depression, anxiety, and terrible pain from a back injury. But the reason he wanted to die, he told City News, was that his rooming house was on the market and he saw little hope of finding an affordable alternative. This is a quote. I don't want to die, but I don't want to be homeless more than I don't want to die. I mean, and so yeah. you have literally people who the public welfare system is so broken in Canada that you have poor people who are choosing maid rather than living on the streets. I've talked to people like that. In fact, this is just so well documented that what I think is more interesting, as horrible and horrifying as it is, is the reaction from the physicians who are doing the work of euthanasia. So I mentioned earlier about Stephanie Green. I interviewed her. So she's the president of the Canadian Association of Made Assessors or Providers, CANA. I asked her in an interview, does she think that people are applying for MAID driven by lack of housing or lack of medical care. Those were all stories that were happening in the news. Her response to me, and this is also what she told the Parliament of Canada, is emphatically no. No one is receiving aid because of a lack of housing. She said that those stories were clickbait. They're untrue. They haven't been reported fully. Well, a year before she told me that, so I interviewed her, I, I believe around May 2022, Pretty much a year before I interviewed her, her organization had an entire seminar just on this topic of people requesting MAID because, quote, of a lack of resources. And they discussed story after story of people receiving and requesting MAID because, again, they have credit card debt, they have a lack of housing, they can't get medical care in Canada because the wait times are so long. You know, poverty. These things are happening, and they're happening at an industrial scale, right? More than 27 people a day died by the hands of their physicians or nurses in Canada in 2021. Last year, in 2022, we still don't have the official data, but every prediction is that it's going to be even higher. 
exit question from me, Alexander. Why is there no outrage? I mean, I am seething with outrage just listening to this. And yet in Canada, uh, there's no outrage about this. I, I don't get it. What's going on? Let me be clear. There is outrage. I, I talked about the more than 140 disability groups that were in uproar. You know, I think the reason why there isn't more vocal outrage is how these expansions happen, right? So 2016 was the first law. The most recent expansion, which removed at all the idea that MAID should even be tethered to being close to end of life, was in 2021. And that passed under COVID. Also, the Canadian media landscape has been extremely biased in favor of MAID. The stories that they reported were moving stories about, let me give you an example. The Toronto Star wrote a long form article about the brave decision for a police officer who died from MAID, who donated his lungs from home. And that's a world first. They covered the story of a couple that was married for 73 years who could die at home together, even though only one of them had a terminal illness. Those were the stories that they covered. The fact that they also covered stories where last month, a married couple who were also married for 73 years were forced to separate because there wasn't space for them to be together in a long-term care home, right? The fact that they covered a story like that, but they didn't expand it to even consider the impact that it would have over why there's so much made is happening in Canada. Last month, there was... For CBC, which is Canada's public broadcast, unlike the NPR, it's uh, listened to much more frequently on a per capita basis. It's one of the main news sources for Canadians. Well, there was a cross-Canada listening tour where people could call in and give their thoughts about the proposed delay for expanding made to people with psychiatric illness. So this was a cross-listening tour. Anybody could call in. I know people who called in. I know that they included a law professor from the University of British Columbia, Isabel Grant, who specializes not only in constitutional law, which is a pertinent to the debate, but also specializes in mental health and mental law. She called in. I know people with disabilities who called in who feel that the legislation around MAID is threatening their lives. And yet, the only people that the producers chose to actually uh, interview to speak on this listening tour were people who are pro-MAID. The only op-ed, the only recent op-ed that was published on MAID in the opinion section of the CBC was an op-ed in favor of MAID expansion. Like, this is a conscious decision. Even the, the very idea of how MAID law was expanded to cover people with psychiatric illnesses, this happened because literally at the last possible point, it was the third reading of the bill in the Senate. So Canada is also a bicameral, uh, Canada's federal government is also bicameral, right? There's a House of Commons, there's a Senate. The Senate, unlike in the United States, it's appointed, not elected. So an appointed senator who's a former liberal candidate who lost his election and then, surprise, was appointed to the Senate after he lost his election. In the third reading of the bill, he introduced an amendment to add a clause to the further expansion of MAID to people beyond, quote, people whose deaths are beyond reasonable proximity, reasonable pathway uh, to death, that bill, which expanded, he added as an amendment, as a surprise amendment, at the last possible moment that there will be a clause to expand this as well to psychiatric conditions. And he justified this position by the fact that he is also a psychiatrist. So the senator's name is Senator Stan Kutcher. What he didn't tell the public in this case is that Stan Kutcher was involved in one of the largest medical fraud scandals in the 20th century. This is not an exaggeration. Like, this is, this is actually what happened. Stan Kutcher was involved in an antidepressant drug. So there's an article that's called, um, yeah, in, in medicine, it's called ghostwriting, which is when a farmer rep writes an article and pays presumably, to uh, physicians uh, so they could use their name and they could publish it under their name. 
right? So the, the whole point is that it, nobody's going to read an academic article if it's published by a farmer. They're going to read it if it's published by a, a physician. The problem for poor Senator Stan Kutcher is that he didn't actually look at the data, or he clearly did not look at the data because the data was fraudulent. And this ghost-written paper was then used to sell antidepressants to uh, young people, even though it ended up causing hundreds of additional suicides and birth defects. This was settled in court in the United States. It was settled for, at the time, the largest settlement of its kind, I think around $3 billion American. This senator uh, was one of the people who uh, published the paper. That was a justification for all this. So you literally have a senator who was involved in the largest medical fraud scandal of the 20th century, who then adds a surprise amendment in the Canada Senate at the last possible moment to expand made uh, to psychiatric illnesses. There's a reason why this happened, right? And it happened because if this was actually debated in the House of Commons, if this was debated in public, there would be opposition from the Canadian public. But instead, it happened in a way that was, while perfectly legal, was clearly immoral and was against what the Canadian public wanted to do. And the Liberal government then used that justification. Oh, look, the independent Senate ended up passing a bill, right, with that amendment. And they used that as a justification to push through that expansion. So we're living in the wake of that decision. So it's pretty shocking that all of this debate, all of this uproar that we're finally seeing happen is happening now, even though the story was two and a half years old at this point. I'm just stunned by everything you're saying. And to add to your point about the CBC, there's a company in Canada, a store chain called Simmons. They actually ran an ad campaign featuring a woman who was taking her own life. And it turned out she didn't want to take her own life. She just couldn't get medical care. Exactly. By the way, uh, just for listeners at home, uh, if you want to look into, uh, you know, don't take my word for it. If you want to look into uh, the whole story involving Stan Kutcher, it, the drug name was called Paxil, P-A-X-I-L. Like this is, it, it has barely been reported inside wow. of Canada. And it wasn't reported at all during the reporting of the most recent expansion of May to mental illnesses even though this is very much uh, related. Um, and in fact, I, often, you know, I, I spoke to some legislators who were shocked and had no idea that Stan Kutcher was even involved with that. Wow. Well, thank wow. you so much for all your great reporting on this, because there's not a lot out there and, and you're bringing it to light. So uh, we're grateful for all you're doing and thank you for coming on the show. Yeah. Thank, thank, you, thank you so, so much. much. Now, thank you for shining a light on this. I don't think it's familiar to most people, and it's absolutely stunning. This actually also reminded me, there's a further wake in this story, which is um, Stan Kutcher is hard, is a member of a joint committee that's studying MAID. So this joint committee uh, published their report, I believe, two weeks ago. And this report advocated for expanding MAID uh, to, quote, mature minors. <laughs> This, yeah, and not only, why not? Yeah, why not? Exactly, at this point. But I think you can see the uneasiness, the unease that these members and supporters of MAID have in Canada, which is one of the recommendations. So according to the legislation, to qualify, you need to have a grievous or irremediable illness or disability. Now, this kind of looks bad because you literally have the term disability in the legislation. And it kind of seems like you're discriminating against people with disabilities. So this joint committee had the brilliant idea of removing, this was one of the recommendations, to remove the word disability just as long as people with disabilities would continue to qualify and die through me. Wow. Wow. Good luck continuing to shine light on this, Alexander. And thank you for being game to join us. We're very grateful. Yeah. Thank you so much for uh, looking into this. And if you do find out what the hell is going on, please let me know. <laughs> All right. Take care. Frankly, when we started talking about having this interview and talking about Canada's euthanasia laws, I didn't realize quite 
how horrifying this was. And I, I thought Alexander's analogy in comparison to Nazi euthanasia laws was really apropos. You know, again, uh, the government of Canada is not the government of Nazi Germany. And Canadian ideas about the purity of the race have nothing to do with any of their euthanasia laws. But at the same time, the notion that you know, inconvenient people, as you said, people who are burdens, quote unquote, on society because they have disabilities or because they have illnesses or because they have psychiatric problems. This is exactly the mentality that animated these laws in the 1930s. And while I think Alexander's right that the Action T, the program that actually systematically murdered uh, Germans who were disabled over a number of years, is, is something different from this, because that was certainly involuntary, there are really disturbing similarities here. Well, these are involuntary in a sense, because put yourself in the shoes of that guy that I described, who... He's disabled from a back injury, so he can't work. He's about to get kicked out of his rooming house, and his option is to live on the streets. You've basically beaten him down to the point where he feels he has no choice but to end his life. When you're a soldier coming back from combat and you have PTSD and you served your country and risked your life, and then you have to wait five years for mental health care to treat it, you're not in any condition to make a decision like this. You've been beaten into it. When you have some debilitating medical condition and you can't get treatment or you can't even get pain management because there's a wait list, these are not voluntary choices. These are not people who want to die. They're people who think they have no other choice but to die. So it is coercive. It may not be compulsory, but it's coercive. And it's coercive through the failure of the Canadian system to take care of its people, you know, and the solution is just to let them choose to die. But it, it's not voluntary at all. In a way, it's more insidious because you're convincing them through their hopelessness to end their own lives rather than just taking it from them. No, there's, I think you're exactly right. There's a predatory element to this as well. And we didn't talk about this, but, you know, there is an epidemic of suicide in our country, and that is apparently all around the world, with young people, young women, teen girls in particular, but they are by far not the only ones. People who are not being counseled, people who are not being taken care of, people whom the systems are failing because they are so devastated, so written out of society that they feel like death is the better option. This is a system that validates that. Canada is validating this epidemic of suicide in ways that I would not have even been able to imagine before I heard it. So I don't want to get into an abortion discussion with you because I know we we disagree on it. And we've had a really good podcast on that where we, I think, found some common ground. So I'm not going to get into that end of the, of the life spectrum. But there is an element here of something that's seeping into our society, which is driven by this, which is a culture of death, right? Which is that the pro-life movement generally has a view that every human life whether it is useful or not useful by society standards, whether it's old or young, productive or unproductive, every human life has dignity. And we are now in the business in Canada of taking the people who society doesn't see as useful, who society doesn't see as having value, who are no longer productive, who are at the older stages of their life, who because of mental illness can't be productive members of society and can't take care of themselves and can't support themselves, that their lives are do not have dignity, their lives do not have worth, and they're giving them this option to take their lives and end the burden that they are on society. That's a fundamental societal-wide problem. And it exists here in the United States as well, that we don't treat people who are on the margins of society as having the same dignity as people who are productive. And it's wrong. Every human life has dignity. And we need to protect every life, even the elderly, even the inconvenient, even those people. We need to have a culture of life that affirms them. And when you fall into a culture of death, this is the natural result which is, okay, people are inconvenient, they're a burden, 
Let's get rid of them. They're old. They're no longer productive. Let's get rid of them. They have an illness. Let's get rid of them. And it's a slippery slope that we're falling into. And it, we think it's, it's north of our border. It can't happen here. Yes, it can. Yep. Yes, it can. And, and you know, look, I don't want to be unjust. Uh, there are people who are in pain, who are on the verge of death. And there is certainly a discussion to be had about whether their lives and their suffering should be eased. But it's not the simple, easy discussion that the Canadians seem to be having. And I don't want to discount their suffering. They're not the people we're talking about in Canada. They're not the people who Canada is facilitating and encouraging to die. And, you know, look, it's unconscionable. We'd love to hear what our listeners have to say about this. If you have different views, don't hesitate to let us know. Thank you for being part of this. I am more shocked after this podcast than I have been after many. Me too. It's a troubling topic, but glad we got some better insight into it because I think our neighbor to the north is is, uh, gravely ill. (laughs) And uh, I don't think they're on the verge of assisted suicide yet, but they're certainly in the process of it as a nation. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Take care. Let us know what topics you'd like us to cover. You can get in touch with the show by emailing us at whatthehell at AEI.org. Or you can reach us on Twitter. I'm at D. Pletka. And I'm at Mark Thiessen. That's Mark with a C. Please rate and review the podcast. If you like the show, please subscribe, share it, comment on Apple Podcasts, or wherever you're listening to this. Thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.